The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Mason Stevens Limited, ABN 91141 447 207, AFSL 351 578, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Decision. The opinions expressed within the podcast are solely the individuals and do not reflect the opinions and beliefs of Mason Stevens. Hello and welcome. My name is Brendan Dade, Senior Financial Advisor at Lorica Partners. Thank you for joining me on this deep dive into all things investment committees. We'll be talking about how to start one, how to make the most of this part of an advice business, and some of the best practices uh, that go into making these work really well. It will be a four-part series where we hear from some of the leading minds about how to make investment committees work. Thanks for joining me. This series is brought to you by Mason Stevens, a specialist wealth platform provider that focuses on managed account solutions. Recognized by Investment Trends in 2023 as the most improved platform and by advisor ratings in 2022 for best advisor support, Mason Stevens offers outsourced CIO services that complement their platform and managed account solutions. Established in 2010, Mason Stevens is led by some of Australia's most experienced finance and investment professionals. Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the fourth and final uh, episode in our series focusing on all things investment committees. I am joined here uh, by Gareth Maid uh, from Blue Rock, and we have Jackie Fernley again from Mason Stevens. Welcome back. Thanks, Brandon. Thanks, Brandon. Um, Gareth, uh, since we've already heard from uh, Jackie uh, before in episode one, I'd love uh, to start with you if we can. And uh, would you mind just giving us a quick little intro to yourself and your practice? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm an investment director here at uh, Blue Rock. Um, we're sort of a multi-factor professional services business that focuses on not just the wealth management piece, um, portfolio management, and financial advice, but we also do uh, legal, accounting, uh, digital um, philanthropy and, and a multitude of other professional services that obviously bolt into you know a busy person's life. Uh, so we look after the life and, and the business of people uh, at the end of the day. Excellent. And uh, tell me, how did you how did you get started? Did you come from the the wealth management uh, side initially, uh, or did you have training and background in another part uh, before looking after clients? Yes, yeah, so I've worked for um, family offices, broking firms, and private banks. Mm -hmm. um, and Blue Rock's been a really good fit for me. Um, we're a fast-growing firm with a real focus on the client, um, change and innovation. Um, and, and that, like I say, that's that's really important for me moving forward, particularly as as the nature of financial services changes over time and how we're able to serve clients. So as, as a dynamic workplace that's able to challenge um, and innovate, that's pretty rewarding for, for not only me, but for my staff and for obviously the clients as well. Excellent, excellent. And and tell me, can you give me a little bit of a flavour of um, you know how many roughly how many clients you look after, how many staff you have, and and where you're located? Yeah, sure. So um, we're located in in Melbourne. We have three offices in Melbourne. Um, have about five thousand clients throughout the whole of the Blue Rock network um, through uh, private wealth and uh, the investment services business. Um, there's about uh, 550, 600 clients. Excellent, great size practice. And Jackie, uh, welcome back. Is there anything that you would like to uh, add, add quickly um, as we as we kick off this morning? Nothing specifically, Brendan. It's good to be back, though. Excellent. Um, well, look, we might just take it back to the beginning. Um, as you know, today we're going to be looking at uh, the investment committee side, uh, and we're going to have a focus on uh, outsourcing within investment committees and, and thinking about the different roles. And we've already had a couple of discussions where our different guests have touched on uh, how this works in their own experience. But uh, maybe to start off with, Gareth, can you tell us about how your investment committee started? Um, who who was involved? How often did you meet? What was the catalyst for starting the investment committee to kick off with? Yeah, sure. Um, so the private wealth business has been running now for about eight or 10 years. And the, the way that Blue Rock creates its business model is we build a model first 
and then we attract the clients to that and then we attract the clients to that model. So whilst we do have the ability to, I guess, build the plane while it's flying, which a lot, which a lot of businesses have to do, um, we typically build the structure, try and build best of breed and best practice so that we have the government governance in place. So and, and with an expectation that, you know, you build it and they will come. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's typically how we've um, how we've operated in the past. Uh, as a result of that journey, uh, three or four months ago, uh, three or four months ago, three or four years ago, um, a formalised investment committee uh, was established prior to me joining Blue Rock. I've been with Blue Rock for about two and a half years. Um, we had some external relationships, some uh, information that was provided by third parties, but predominantly it was run by internal staff and, and staff members. Um, one of the issues that we identified with that structure was that there, there could possibly be a tendency towards brute think. Mm-hmm. And then obviously, you know, you're working with your peers, you might be working with someone that you report to, there can be unspoken hierarchies as a result of um, those relationships between staff. A- as a business, we spend a lot of time looking at that structure and in a way of us improving it, improving the due diligence, improving the governance and also having a degree of independence. Now, I have to be very careful when I say independence as it relates to financial advice, obviously, but of course, um, yes. a, a degree of independence um, for, for, for both research, governance, and, and really key decision-making, uh, we identified that we needed some assistance with that to to really build a best of breed. Practice. Excellent. So, yeah, and I think uh, most people can relate to that. Uh, there's If they were sitting in amongst with their peers, trying to make decisions about, say, whether a fund is included or excluded, it might be difficult for someone who is going to be reporting to you know, their boss and say, no, I think your, your yeah. idea is terrible, right? Like that's that's not going to get a lot of traction. And, and look, I've worked for businesses that are really small, right? You know, they've had three or four people, good funds under management, um, the investment committee, and I'll have to put that in inverted commas, investment committee function was... You know, people sitting around having coffee, deciding on the portfolios in a fairly informal structure. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I've also worked for large organisations where it's quite institutional, but at the end of the day, everybody's an employee of the head company. So there is a tendency towards group think. What we wanted was we wanted the the dynamism of um, a forward thinking business, but also having a, a degree of rigour and institutional grade um, compliance and um, due diligence around everything that we do. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Jackie, I think we reflected on this a little bit in the first episode. Uh, this is sounding uh, like what you commonly experience when you come into uh, an investment committee. Is, is is this the similar look and feel of where you generally start? Oh, absolutely. There's, um, there's no doubt that um, the first iteration is never the last iteration of an investment committee. There's always the the typical learning curve, um, and you know, Blue Rock's investment committee and structure and process has really grown up over those over the last three or four years. And it, it's not to say it was there was anything wrong with it in the beginning. It was right for the business at that point in time. But you know, Blue Rock's growing um, rapidly, and the the more it grows, the the importance is that it's really important that your investment committee and your structure and your governance and everything else grows up with it. And they've done a really good job of, of developing that over time. And to what what we have now collectively, because I work really closely with Gareth on a day-to-day basis, I think is absolutely a best of breed investment governance structure and investment committee um, framework that we work to. Yeah, excellent. So La, I'm keen to dive into that in a bit more detail and help to unpack, you know, what that development specifically has looked like, because I suspect that for a lot of listeners, either they don't have an investment committee set up at this point, it's something they're exploring or thinking about, or it might be, uh, you know, like you said for Gareth, um, you know, a, a quarterly commitment to sit around and have a coffee and shoot the breeze about a portfolio and mm. tick that box and move on. Um, so I'm I'm keen to I'm keen to hear a little bit more about uh, those first steps that you took. So it sounds like, and tell me if I'm wrong, the investment committee started initially entirely in house. What was the first step that you took to build out that governance? Um, where, where did you start? So 
you know, we had we had source documents, we had philosophy, we had governing rules of all the portfolios. We had all those things that are really important when you're when you're constructing a, a sophisticated business. And where did, did you get those from? Sorry, Gareth, just quickly. Is that all developed we, we by yourself? Or? Yep. Okay. We we created those. So um, you know, it it built the philosophy of how um Blue Rock sees funds management. Um, and that that leveraged the experience of the inv- individuals who created those, you know, created the business in the first place. Mm-hmm. Um, and we had external we had external members of the investment committee who gave us um, who gave us advice as well. But we felt that it was really important for the business because it, we'd been doing it for four or five years, like a, or maybe slightly shorter you know, under that structure to go back to the source code. And ask ourselves: Were the deci- the core decisions about portfolio construction, governance, um, the types of people that were engaging to help help us, mm-hmm. were they all in line and and assisting us to achieve the best risk adjusted returns for clients? So, and people probably can't see this now, but Jackie's smiling because we know that we went all the way back to the original documents, you know. Um, Recutting, rewording philosophies about every single in- individual portfolio, their relative benchmarks, how they were constructed, um, philosophical views in regards to certain asset classes, for instance. You know, what is what does fixed interest mean? Does it mean does it mean bonds? Does it does it mean does it mean mortgages? And then, do we have the technical expertise in regards to these asset classes to form views in regards in in regards to them? So, sure. for instance, if we're going to be invested in bonds. Are the investment committee in a position to be able to manage day-to-day positioning of um, average maturities on the curve, for instance, or would 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 be prefer to have a third-party manager, or indeed, uh, do we form a view where we prefer to um, control the credit worthiness rather than the rather than the duration on the curve? So, you know, it sounds like we really got into the weeds, and we did, and we and we spent a lot of time working on it, but what it's built is it's built a really great platform for the portfolio to portfolios to move forward and for the business to move forward on a on a risk adjusted basis, which was very important for us. That was that was a key part of the process for us. Right. Okay. So it was a, a reflection and I think Jackie, we we might have spoken about this as well, um, about almost like an audit of the skill sets and the requirements that need to go into the decision making and and making sure there's a match there, whether internal or external. Is that is that roughly the process? Absolutely. And and when I say we went into the weeds, I was smiling because we went into the weeds. Um, it was painstaking. It took a, quite a bit of time. Um, How much time are we talking here? Well, well for me, because I, qu- I did quite a lot of the heavy lifting around it, which is what we do when we go into that environment and they and a wealth practice engages with us is it becomes somewhat of a heavy front-ended consultive process uh, where we, we we will take our templated investment committee charter and our templated investment governance framework and a, a suite of policies that we have the base level built mm-hmm. but then to finish them, that is the the getting into the weeds. How do we want to think about this? How where are our circles of competence in different asset classes? There's a lot of questions that we take um, a wealth practice through, and then there's a certain amount of navel gazing that occurs as a consequence of that. But the importance of it, it sounds a little bit painstaking, and that's because it is. But we are now in a position with the investment committee to go, hang on a second, that's not how this portfolio runs. That's not how we've agreed this asset class will be structured. It it really allows us to anchor to an agreed set of parameters and keeps us on track. And whilst I may be the chair and um, and I'm used to working with a wealth practice like this, Everyone sitting around that table knows the rules of engagement and they can all keep each other accountable to it. And it, this is about reducing mistakes mm. um, and so and keeping us all accountable to a framework that's agreed. And it sounds like I'm being quite rigid and inflexible. It's not. It's just it, it's a focus on making sure we've got clear guardrails around the decisions we're making. 
Yeah, excellent. And it it sounds like then the so the first step, if I if I can call it that, uh, joining the IC for Gareth, you've come in as as the outsource CIO. Mm-hmm. The first thing that everybody needs to do is get their head around, you know, what are the what are the rules of the game here? What are we going to try and just define as success? How are we going to track how we're pro- progressing? Um, all, all of those things is the, just the, the very first big to-do list um, before you go diving into fund manager selection, <laughs> which I think is the impression that most people have. And, and IC spends its day uh, days scratching its chin over. Um, but yeah, maybe a bit more robust than that. And hey, Gareth, what was that process like for you? Look, it was it, it was really good. Sometimes... You know, you get you you get caught up in in your own business, and um, it's difficult to take the time out to to really pause, look at portfolio construction, look at the look at the way that you're doing things for clients. Again, particularly on a risk adjusted basis, um, but have that time put aside to go back to the source code, understand what we're trying to achieve for clients, which we had a good grasp on, but to ask those questions again. Um, and to build that robust framework has certainly set the business up for a, for a lot of success. Um, I'm particularly mindful of um, the fact that, you know, portfolio construction is easy 70% of the time um, because, you know, it's the old monkey with the dartboard. When the market's going up, everybody's pretty happy about things. Yeah. Uh, and it's, and the conversation with the clients, let's face it, if you're an advisor and you've got a positive number and it's tracking pretty well, yeah, you're looking forward to those conversations. Uh, because you look at me, look at me, how great am I, you know, um, come back, I'll see you next year. But if we go through a challenging market environment, you have to justify the reasons that you took and the steps that you took in in order to protect the client's capital. You know, those are the challenging conversations where you want to be able to point at robust frameworks, um, due process, um, and well-constructed portfolios to, to defend those conversations with clients. Mm-hmm. Um, even if you've outperformed on a on a relative basis, so for us, it, it's is as much about the normal operating pace as it is, you know, foreshadowing that at some point in the future, some of us are going to have, and some of the staff are going to have difficult conversations with disappointed clients, um, and this is all part of this structure. Yeah, and frankly, it also sounds like quite a quite a humbling experience because, you know, by definition, you're bringing in someone else for a perspective which you have to admit you don't have. And then you have to let them go through and point out all the things that you haven't thought about. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, uh, you pay for, the, pay for the pleasure of, you know, somebody telling you that you might be wrong in a bunch of places too. Oh, and, and you know. but, but look, that, that's part of the process. I mean, having an independent chair... And then an independent um, uh, macroeconomic and in- investment team that also comes to us, and being able to leverage off those relationships is an, is an important part, part of why we engage with both Mason Stevens and MST. Um, we we recognise that at the end of the day, we're a small to medium sized investment business. You know, we're not a Goldman Sachs. We don't have thirty analysts sitting there um, help assisting us. Um, nor do we need thirty analysts sit- sitting there to assist us. But, but we need to have a robust framework in order to be able to support us. And um, to be able to, frankly, create that leverage and that expertise on a relatively cost-effective basis is, is extremely important for Blue Rock. Yeah, absolutely. And Jackie, I'm imagining that's a similar set of priorities for others that you see as well. Well, absolutely. I, I'm just reflecting on a conversation I had with someone yesterday who is in the early part of their journey and, you know, they're, they're like a kid in a candy store in terms of the opportunity they see of getting the breadth of um, toolkit that their advice practice needs at a, a really cost-effective price versus if they built it in-house. And if I just unpack that for a minute, uh, when they work, and I think about what Blue Rock's done with the combination of both using Mason Stevens and MST Marquee, they have four, well, they have three, no, sorry, four, four individuals directly attached to their ind- their business, all with high caliber, long investment careers. And those four individuals are then also attached um, to a suite of other service providers. So for example, Hassan Tevik, who sits on the head um, investment committee, 
um, of Blue Rock uh, is the is the, the global strategist for MST Marquis. He's worked around the globe um, and and considered uh, as an asset consultant our investment strategist for um, some major investment banks. Um, and he brings a wealth of knowledge. They also have John Lockton, who is um, from Sandstone, the com- Sandstone, which is a component of MST Marquis, who accesses the breadth of MST's direct equity analysts to support the direct equity selection across their business. They have Andrew Ash, who works within my team, who's a 20-year veteran of managed fund selection, and they obviously have myself as well across um, the three investment committees. The cost associated with that might is not that significant in insofar and in comparison to the cost associated with trying to do anything like that internally. And I think the collective nature of the all those minds together will not only develop a, a, a really good suite of investment risk adjust investment returns over time, but it also gives um Blue Rock an ability to market that opportunity um, and bring a lot of credibility to the investment solution that they're offering their clients and they're you know Gareth and his team are able to to look at that um suite of experts and and it's a compelling case when they're presenting that to their end clients yeah absolutely absolutely uh, I'd be keen if you can Jackie maybe just to unpack um the the efficiency and sort of economic side of that uh for us a little bit more if, if you can and conscious that yeah we'll we'll be have, having listeners from a range of different practice backgrounds but maybe maybe if we could start by saying you know when is the what's the earliest that you could really consider having an outsourced CIO involved in your committee um, and uh, maybe the best way to measure that is funds under management within the practice presumably if i only have 20 million dollars of thumb in a practice I'm probably not ready for an outsourced CIO. <laughs> um, yeah, well, yeah. Is there a rule of thumb there that you can sort of give some guidance around and um, see where, where that starts to really make a lot of sense? Sure. And um, you you might be surprised at my answer to this and um, because it can be quite a small number. So for us as, as a business, a Mason Stevens, remembering we are focused on managed account solutions. So we are talking, we work in partnership with our wealth practices to help them build their businesses in a scalable way. The economics of that managed account, the reality is that there can be a fee, an appropriate fee, basis point fee attached to the development of that managed account, which can then fund the costs associated with managing that capital. So we economically, we can share the upside um, and based on fun and grow with that client. So our costs are generally fun fee and we'll spend a reasonable amount of time deciding which clients we will work with in that context because we are essentially deciding is this wealth practice actually going to grow or not? Um, and so we will allocate our resources accordingly, but it can be, as a consequence, quite inexpensive in the first instance because we're taking the view, will we get paid eventually, How and, and really we're backing different wealth practices to deliver over time, and therefore the fun amount in the beginning can be quite small. Um, so I don't want to put an actual number on it because – it's not as simple as that, but you know, Blue Rock is growing funds under management aggressively, and they have been for multiple years. So we were very comfortable in partnering with Blue Rock within that structure because they've proven themselves um, to be a, a robust, growing, consistent wealth practice over many years, mm. uh, and then sort of building out. Um, the framework that we've now built with Blue Rock. So just for everyone's, um, for clarity, we have a, a head co or an investment committee that has um, that sits at the top level who is 
they're primary responsible for all portfolio decisions um, outside of the direct equity decisions and the high conviction list or APL. Those two component parts are delegated to the managed fund selection committee that looks after the APL and high conviction list and the direct equity committee that focuses on the internal equity portfolios. So we use John Lockton from MST on the direct equity portfolio committee and we use Andrew Ash from my business from Mason Stevens in in the managed fund selection. Right. So we are able to also um, utilize MST in that construct um, and in that instance we are utilizing some of the brokerage that Blue Rock would generally spend to transact direct equity portfolios to pay for some of that support. So what I'm presenting is a fairly economic way of actually bringing in high caliber investment professionals in, in a in a way where the costs grow with the business. And at some point, Blue Rock will be big enough that they internalize potentially. Mm. Um, or maybe they never will. Um, but the point being is it isn't as prohibitive as um, you might think from the outside. Yeah. And I guess in many ways, that's a direct parallel to how a lot of advisors think about their clients, right? You know, <laughs> we're making an assessment assessment about who you bring on as a, as a client and, you know, what the costs are going to be involved. A lot of that's got to do with the growth and the future complexity and how much, uh, you know, you think you'll be able to be involved and add value to the family individually. It sounds very much like you're taking the same view, but, but across to, to a practice as a whole. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. And I think commercially as well, there are there are other arrangements where um, other types of outsourcing can can go for a fixed fee, where maybe that's more challenging, perhaps in the early days, uh, if, if you've got a fixed annual fee for a certain amount of commitment, certain amount per you know, per quarter or, or whatever it is that you're asking for that outsource uh, analyst or outsource CIO or outsource you know, whoever whatever capacity. Um, to, to have them come in to the ICs. Is that fair? That That's right. And there is, and I think we talked about this um, on the first podcast, there is no doubt there's a, there's an ecosystem around this industry of asset consultants from fairly small organisations, and some of them are very good. But they obviously have one revenue line, and therefore they need to ensure that they've got a minimum revenue attached to each client they take on where I'm in a, an incredibly fortunate position sitting in Mason Stevens where we have multiple revenue lines and it's a profitable growing business, we can cross-subsidize um, the the costs associated with providing the services in the, in the near term. And that enables me to price um, and back different wealth practices in this form. Yeah, excellent. Uh, and Gareth, I'd be curious to know from your perspective, you know, there are different ways of outsourcing within an IC. You know, you, you could have just decided to go and get someone to, you know, run a bunch of the numbers and take on more of an analyst or research role. Why is it that you decided to start with outsourcing your CIO? What? Well, why was that an important decision for you? Yeah, look, you're right. Um, we could have um, engaged uh, an, an analyst in the business um, and that would have worked really well from an analysis perspective, but wouldn't have given us the governance and wouldn't give us the ability to leverage off a, off a third party firm, wouldn't give us the ability to leverage off a whole bunch of experience, probably would have cost us more money. Uh, and all we would have done was probably generate more groupthink uh, in the business. So uh, from, from that perspective and, and weighing all those things up, um, this was the best solution for us. Absolutely. Jackie, are there any roles where you would not come in as a CIO to kick off with? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I giggle a little bit. Um, you know, one of, and Gareth's heard me say this um, a, a couple of times, I think you absolutely need to have an alignment of investment philosophy. Um, so for me personally, if the wealth practice wants to run high conviction, high octane 
portfolios in a wealth setting, then I'm not the right person to help them. That's not how I think. That's not the way in which I invest. So when there's a misalignment of investment philosophies and thinking, I will be the first person to say, oh, let me attach you to this asset consultant because you're more likely to um, get on better. And then there's just, there is always culture. And whether that's when you are hiring your own team members uh, or whether or not it's it's about who you want to work with or the culture in a board meeting, think of an investment committee like a board. It, it It is the culture of that room and the dynamic of that room. You know, there, there needs to be a, um, a personality and an and engagement on a personal level. Um, so there are some people I just don't think I'm the right person to work with them. And again, I will attach them to an asset consultant who I think is a better placed to work with that individual or group of individuals. Or if I see, for example, a governance structure at the wealth practice that is fraught with danger, but they're not prepared to call a spade a spade um, and change it so that the room can speak freely, again, I don't want to really play in that sphere either. So I, yeah, it just depends on a number of things. But, you know, if I think I'm going to be successful with that wealth practice, then we will work with them. Otherwise, I'll do what I can to attach them to someone who's going to get a better outcome for them. And I imagine that's a fine line because, you know, on one hand, you know, Gareth has sort of said, and I think others have too, is that you the benefit of having somebody independent is that you don't want group think. You don't want someone just to go and reiterate the decisions you were going to make anyway. There's probably no value in that. But at the same time, they have to be changes that, that everybody sees the logic in and is comfortable in and can see that they're being made for the right reasons. Um, you know, that, that's, that might not be entirely different to a entire misfit of philosophical alignment. So I imagine that's something that takes a little bit of time to tease out to make sure that you're working with the right person. Is that is that a fair comment? Yeah, absolutely. And then like any other scenario, there's often red flags early that you can tell. Uh, simple red flags where internal advice practices might say, yeah, I, I definitely want you in the room, but you don't get a vote. It's like, okay, right. how come? <laughs> Walk me through that. Why? Sure. So my my view's not valid in your mind. It's just interesting. There are flags. You you can tell if that wealth practice is truly open to the journey or not. So, you know, there might be some really big personalities, and we all know there's some really big personalities in this industry oh, yeah. who will um be loud and throw their weight around. Again, I'm not interested. <laughs> so it just depends on the culture of that organization and where, whether I truly think they're ready for it. Sure. Uh, I mean, I, I like the the analogy of the red flags uh, and the things that we look out for. Again, I think most of us as advisors do that with clients as well. Um, watch out for the signals and behaviors and think that maybe that's not going to be a good fit. Gareth, from your perspective, what were the green flags that made you think that, yeah, I'm on the right track here. This is This is giving us value. What were the what were the light bulb moments where you realized, hey, we probably wouldn't have done this on our own or what we would have done wouldn't have been to the same quality or, or level of excellence? You know, um, are there any examples that come to mind for you? Yeah, I'll tell you what we were looking out for. Um, we were fearful that through this journey, not only would, would we get institutional level advice and due diligence, we'd become institutionalized. Um, and the one thing that Blue Rock fiercely fights against, and if, if you jump on that website and you see the branding, you come into the office, you see how the staff holds themselves, we we definitely don't want to become institutionalized. Um, and so there was a concern that we drift towards um, becoming glorified Vanguard portfolios. At the end of the day, we'd lose the dynamism, uh, you know, we'd, we'd lose the energy, we'd, we'd lose the ability to have highly considered views in regards to certain segments of the portfolios. That's certainly what we didn't want to achieve. Mm. By going back to the source material 
and saying, who are we? What do we stand for? Um, and agreeing on that again, because there were, you know, 80% of it, 90% of it, we didn't change. You know, this this sounds like we've gone back and we've put a we've put a line a red line through everything. You know, we've become this institution. You know, we, we look like all oh, portfolios just look like mirrors of Vanguard, and we're in debt tugging. You know, that hasn't been occurred. Um, and it's because we went back to the you know the the green flags for me were because it was so well considered because we went back to the source code and because we took the time. Um, this enabled us to build portfolios which reflect. Um, high quality governance and what we stand for as a business and then how we see our clientele and how our clients expect their portfolios to be dealt with. You know, the the, the website, the branding, how we hold ourselves in marketplace is highly energized, very differentiated. Um, but at the end of the day, that's very exciting, but we're still custodians of our of our clients' wealth. Um, and and we, we realize that's an, ex- an extremely important role to play. And by having some of those things that, that we held dear to us, challenged by in, independent chair, challenged by MST, um, you know, whether we agreed with all of them, that, you know, that, that didn't occur. Uh, we're still able to put our own stamp um, on portfolios and portfolio construction because we're, we are our own business, but we haven't, we haven't lost our identity. We haven't lost our, our branding where we stand in the marketplace as a result of this journey. And so for us, um, that was an extremely important part of the engagement. Um, and to Jackie's early point, you know, we'd been working with Jackie for you know, 12 months prior to this to this journey that, that, that we went on, and there was already an alignment of views uh, amongst the broader investment committee. So for us, uh, it was an extension of the engagement that we already had for, um, had with Mason Stevens rather. For, for other people, it might be challenging, right? You know, you, you come in, people are going to ask questions about your views, um, I think that's a healthy exercise, and and a, and a Blue Rock we're pretty used to it. I've got to say, everybody's always asking questions. Why did you do it this way? Is there a better way of doing this? Mm-hmm. Um, and we've identified that there is a better way of doing it, so we'll go and do it. It's a, it's pretty much as simple as that. Yeah, excellent. I, I I'm conscious that there's a real how do I say this? The, the, there's a balancing act there that we've touched on a few times here about who actually makes these decisions and the governance around them. Uh, to give us a flavor of where you've landed and where you are today, might not always be the structure for, for all time, but you said that there's a, an investment committee that sits across the top and has subcommittees, one for managed funds, one for direct equities. Jackie, you've touched on you know, the, the members of those committees. Um, Gareth, I'm assuming that in, in addition to yourself, there are other advisors within your practice who also sit on that committee. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. O- across all three committees. Across all three. You know, like any good football team, you put your best full forwards on the front line and you put your best backline people on the back line. We've taken the people from our business who are best positioned to um, consider Australian equities in the Australian equities committee. I'm not, right. it's not my specialisation. I realise that I don't sit in that committee. Um, I've probably been more down the, 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 the funds management path um, as a result of my experience. So I sit in that committee. Sure, sure. Yeah. If... Uh, just by by voting, and I hope I'm uh, not asking too sensitive a question. Um, mm-hmm. But by voting power, if you know, if you wanted to disagree with with Jackie as the as the CIO, is is that something that you're able to do, or do you do you have those set up in a way that it's a sort of fifty fifty vote? Um, who who can overrule who in a mm-hmm. in a, what I would describe as a very advanced sort of governance structure like you have? Who, who ultimately makes the call here? Um, you know, we've got a, we've got the chair, but then we also have other members, and we have presumably shared voting power. When it comes yeah. to crunch time, how does how does that actually how does that actually work? Well, that was agreed in the source material when when we went back and you know rebuilt the structure, frankly. And so at the moment, uh, if there is an impasse or if we don't reach quorum, then we've decided that the chair should have the casting vote. We've been running it for a few months now. We haven't got to that yet um, because largely, look, like I said, whilst there isn't group think there's a broad alignment of views. So, yeah, it's, it's a pretty easy structure to run at the end of the day. Fair enough. Anything you'd like to add to that, Jackie? Um, I'd just add to the comment Gareth made earlier. We have to remember that um, I had been working with the Blue Rock team for 12 months before we put this structure in place. 
they knew me, I knew them. And that that sort of would have, I'm assuming, and I don't want to put words into Gareth's mouth, but that probably gave them the confidence to actually give me that veto right because they were looking for independence. Um, and the reality is that they can shoot me at any time and, and so and switch me out. But you know, I can imagine that that isn't necessarily the way other wealth practices who haven't worked with their asset consultant or their um, their, their outsource CIO may not want to allocate that veto right um, in the early days. It, and there's no right or wrong. It's just a function of for Blue Rock at the time with the the mix of people and and everything else and what they're trying to achieve. The the goal was very clearly defined as best practice governance. And best practice governance is around having independence as well. And that that was really clear as the directive. So that doesn't necessarily mean that if you don't have that, it's bad governance. It's just it just depends on exactly what it is that you're trying to achieve. And my my goal is to never in, it be in a position where I need to use that veto right. Yeah, I think well, it's easy to imagine that there's a you know full blown conflict over whether or not a fund is included or the weight of a target asset allocation. But it, as you say, you know, hopefully those decisions and the groundwork has been made to lead up to uh, something that is sensible enough for for most people to agree with. Uh, you know, most of the time. Um, but even in the times that there's not, you have a sensible way of making those decisions and, and cutting through those disagreements in, in a way that hopefully gives the best result for the client. That's right. And the rest of the time, everyone has an equal vote. It's not weighted by anything. Very good. Very good. Um, Gareth, as we as we bring things to a close here, I really appreciate uh, you sharing your journey and, and the different uh, paths and, and ultimately where you've landed, which sounds which sounds excellent. Um, is there any advice that you would give to to your earlier self when you were starting out on this this journey? Uh, if it was available, why didn't we do it earlier? <laughs> would, would be would be my advice. Um, and to just ask the question about your business: um, Are you representing your clients in in a one hundred percent the best way that you could? Look, the service wasn't available prior, and. We had a we had a great framework. I, d- I don't want to undersell this. You know, we had a properly defined investment committee, external ex- um, expertise. Um, it was well considered. We always had the clients at the, at the forefront of everything that we that we did. Um, we had externals to help us with administration support. We you know we had a really robust framework. But we asked the question again: Is this the best structure? Uh, for us and for our clients, um, Mason Stevens approached us um, with a new structure that they were looking at in this externalized CIO function, and we thought it was better than what we had, uh, and so we went. That's great. Jackie, would you, I think I asked you this before, but I'm curious to see if you have a slightly different answer uh, reflecting on the conversation we've just had. <laughs> uh, you know, what advice would you give to someone who's starting out on this journey? Uh, maybe someone, take Garrett's example, who 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 has a bit more of a structure already in place and wants to advance it, maybe to narrow it in a bit and we'll go with that. Uh, I think the advice would be to just step back and find that time and mental energy brain space to sit back and really ask the question, is this structured in the best interests of my end client? Am I getting the right outcomes? Where are my holes? And even if you sit and whiteboard it and really think about, do I have the right people in the room? Could I do this better? There's not what's stopping you picking up the phone and just chatting for half an hour and and you're spitballing with someone, whether or not that's someone from another wealth practice or whether it's calling into Mason Stevens, it doesn't really matter. Just thinking about the, the the continual evolution of, can I do this better? Um, because no one ever is perfect. I'm sure we will continue to iterate Blue Rock's process, but that that's that's kind of the beauty of it, isn't it? It's it's just like always trying to one one step forward. That's the growth mindset, and I just would encourage people just to sit back and reflect. That's excellent. 
Well, Jackie, Gareth, thank you so much for your time today. It's been a pleasure talking to you and some great insights there, and we really appreciate it. Thanks, Brendan. Thanks, Brendan.